more sort of relaxed time to get to know the three of you. Uh, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's the 14th of September, uh, 2011, and um, we are going to be talking about, do you, does your book have a name yet? Uh, it's the BU book, the BU. BU. Okay. Um, and <laughs> Monica, I'd, I'd love to just throw this to you um, and see what's up. <laughs> uh, I'll, right. I'll be glad to be a critical friend here, but. Super. <laughs> um, Tell us about your book. So just a tiny bit of history. Um, because of permission given to me by my district, um, I've been a math teacher, and I've, they've allowed me some space to just really listen to kids um, on the topic of, wow, a lot of people are stressed. Teachers are stressed. Parents are stressed. How could we change up the day? Kids are stressed. How could we change up the seven hours we spend in school or work or whatever? and um, you know, make it a change happen there. So we look specifically at how could we change and redefine school. So two years ago, the kids that I was really listening to wrote a, crafted a four-year plan of disruption, a quiet revolution. Can I ask um, a detail on that? <laughs> please do, yeah. please do. Good. How many kids and how, how did you organize that? Okay, so um, the, the first year we started really talking about this in depth, it was, you know, probably one to 200 kids that were, you know, feeding all this information in through math oh, really? classes, through student leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and then we decided, well, let's try it with math. Let's try a self-directed math class. So that was 30 kids. And they all had laptops and they taught themselves. Um, then we decided at the end of that year, learning through all our failures each year, that year, um, not enough kids were passionate about school math in order to self-direct. So then the next year, during that year though, they wrote the four-year plan. So that was about 30, you know, not all 30 kids did that though. It was, it was input from all of them, but some of them were just interested in doing the math. Mm -hmm. um, so then the next year, which was last year, was year one of this four-year plan, which was the innovation lab and tweaked out going for math and said, let's go for passion. Last year was about 50 kids, um, all, all ages, within our district, um, most of them, though, from the high school that I was at. Mm -hmm. So um, this is, we're in year two now. Uh, the fourth year has a uh, city as the floor plan, and especially for ninth through 12th graders, it's more like a university campus, and they're it's a your school design it. You've got a mentor group by then who helps you decide, you know, what resources in the city should we use this week, this month, you know, and um, it's it's away from prescribed learning. It, it, and that doesn't mean it's away from even algebra or it's away from, you know, chemistry. It's just away from someone else deciding what you need to learn um, outside of your mentor group. So. Um, Year two, we're, we're kind of pushing ahead a little bit more because we ended up with this incredible space. Uh, we wanted to move downtown so that they could walk to apprenticeships, so we could show Lisa Gansky's The Mess. We could show that we don't need more resources. We just need to be more res resourceful with spaces, with who could be a mentor. Um, and so the plan was to move downtown, but we, didn't, we weren't envisioning this incredible space. Um, so... Uh, because can it's kids, moving along. And can kids still move from the high school to your space? Is that still walkable it, too? Yeah, it's, it's, well, it never was walkable to come to that one. It, just for those high school kids that were at that high school, it was walkable. But, uh -huh. And it's, it's now all ages. And so most of them are driven there. You know, some mm -hmm. of them are trying to get into the bike mode because we are trying to start a, a zip bike program as well. So anyway, um, just because of the nature of it coming out of its shadows, coming out of its disruption, and other people kind of getting what we're doing, um, we've been encouraged to, to make it more edible. And one of the things that's been encouraged is to write a book. So that's where this book thing came from. Um, then we, to be a little more aggressive, um, I invited a few people to, that had the same vision and were trying to do some of the same things to start meeting on Hangouts. And 
have working sessions, you know, where we really feel like if, you know, if we're not doing something and it's not being useful, then um, there wasn't really a purpose to meet. So we, we started those sessions, uh, narrowed it down to five main elements that we thought were important um, for this quiet revolution to take place anywhere, starting any time that anybody wants to. So that's the background. And be, but Monica, you can't see this, I don't think, but on the live stream are is the the page that has the five things on it do you want okay. to say what those are again briefly yeah or so um asked um thomas in maine and marianne in new jersey and you know other people um amy who's on the left there amy lewark who is an unschooling mom in the lab and joe beer who's been you know we've been working talking back and forth um, for a couple of years just to help write the book and ask kids to help write as well. Well, short story, how it ended up funneling down. Mary Ann wrote the first piece because I really wanted her to write about rhizomes. Well, once she wrote it, we decided this is no longer a chapter. This is really the essence of all the chapters, this rhizomatic nature, that it's um, no visible beginning or no visible end and everything seems to be connected to everything else. And if, if it breaks off, it, that's just more opportunity for more growth. Um, and so that really is the essence of the book. We retitled re it that. And then the five chapters, um, first of all, is the detox. Uh, actually, you know what, Joe Beer, do you want to step in and, and talk about this? Or do you want me to start carrying on? <laughs> I'm the spokesman. Okay. So let me just set him up a little bit. Joe Beer, um, originally from India, he's been at Michigan Tech, um, and just got a master's degree there, uh, was, in, you know, again, we were communicating and was thinking about getting his doctorate at a local university, Colorado State University, where we happened to be doing um, research with um, James Folkstead. And um, that didn't work out, but something else just worked out. He was able to come for 10 days. So he's, first time we've seen him face to face, we've spent 10 incredible days where we were blown away each day by the things that happened in, in that, that house. And the house has now become a physical um, a being that replicates the web and replicates this rhizomatic space, learning, whatever. Um, so one of the things in the house, and we, we'll tell you about some other things too, but one of the things is one of the rooms is the detox room. In fact, when you first walk in, that's the first thing it says detox room. And we feel like this is our room of responsibility to where we could just have this really fun house and just have a lot of fun, you know, and a lot of people are doing innovation. But if we really believe in equity and if we really believe in a culture of trust and it's a people agenda, then we need to share it out. So this is, um, we've modeled the room after the five chapters of the book. And so we've all been, we want it to be like a standalone tour, but we've all been, you know, going through it because it's so visual now and people do come in for tours all the time. So Joe Beer is our latest and um, I think he should take it from here and give us a tour of, imagine that you're in the room and he's giving the tour. All right, starting from the detox booth. <laughs> Wherever you want to start, rhizomatic. Okay, so, right? Because most of the students are used to getting instructions and acting based on that they are used to um, things that they need directions to act. They are not used to think independently on themselves. So that's why we have this detox booth. If Monica, would it be possible if you just go there and I'll just talk here and you just give the tour of that? Sure, there's, it, uh, if, I'll come back up if it's really loud though, because there's a group down there. We're, it, we're pretty much oh. 24 seven, the house is we can, we can mute you, we can mute. The, oh, your, yeah. you can mute yourself. Oh, that would and be just... perfect. That would be perfect. It's true that I'm in that house. <laughs> oh, no, we're finding a purpose for video <laughs> rather than just looking at each other. I actually, uh, in the morning, one of the kids, he, he uh, videotaped me giving a tour of that house. So I'm, I have fresh memory of that, so I can explain again. Okay, hold on. 
But the question is, if I'm gonna speak, I'll be visible to everybody. Oh, yeah, you can see there. In her. Okay, that's a detox room, which is more like a confession box. Um, the detox room, as I said, is mainly for people who are who are more used to instructions and acting on them. So what we need in this detox room is the booth. This is the first thing. As you walk in into the detox booth, there's a laptop over there which captures your video and stores accordingly in a particular folder. And these videos are actually the reflections. Now these steps over there, there's a laptop, there's a chair. So these vi these videos will be used to uh, do the research on the student's reflection from day to day. So for example, if I am new to, I am a walkout student from schooling and ninth grade, I just go there and, and be because I don't have any, uh, I don't know what to talk about. So I'll start with the notice thing and you know, noticing things around me, what interests me and what doesn't. And, and going on to the levels of dreaming about some of the things later on. And then once you have some foundation, I can start connecting with people locally, globally, on the web, anywhere, and then start something doing about it. So that's a detox group. And every day or two times a week or whatever, students will give their reflections on their feelings and whatever they feel about how they're doing. And that's, as Monica said, it's temporary because once a student or the kid is out of that phase of getting instructions and acting, then we don't need. So the second part of it is actually this, which, in which we're making community as a, as, as a school rather than just school as only resource for education. So if you can see that Joe, he is uh, connected to a band on your northwest, northeast, I would say, and then He's part of a team. He's also taking AP classes with computer. Uh, he's also working with MIT down there uh, on something. And he's also learning Hebrew uh, from the web. So the point is, he is doing many things at one point, not just six courses of something. And how often and is then if Joe... You go down, then... I... How often is Joe at the house? So it is not important for Joe to be at the house all the time, whenever he feels that he has to be. Sometimes you learn enough outside the house and just you want to share something, you just come to the house. It is all, it, this house is a physical entity, but it does not represent everything. The BU is actually a mindset rather than of anything physical. So he or she uh, can be anywhere in the world and still be at the B house because it's it's a, it's a mental thing rather than a physical thing. Bihuas it just represents uh, it's a physically that uh, it exists, it exists, and it's also connected to the web. We'll show you what we mean when it's connected to the web. It's also a web in itself. So this is Joe. So there's no limitation, no classes, and there's free food here. I love the food. <laughs> <laughs> free food. Um, Come on. Yeah, yeah, it's, there's free food. I mean. Linda, she cooks awesome, and she also cooks vegetarian food. I love her. Um, so this is because you can. There's no. There's nothing like there's. There's going to be a lunch break or something. You want to have a break? Go for a break. You don't want. You don't like it? Just go out. Whatever you want to do. So these are these are the schools. If you see BHU houses in the middle, uh, this is like the schools become resources rather than the only sole education providers. So these boxes, I think, am I right, Monica? These boxes are the schools, buildings. So they are the resources places where you can go and learn from and just, you know, uh, come back anytime. So the third part of it is actually um, this. this uh, could you, could you? So third part of it is making interdependency, which is having mentors from different backgrounds and different people. For example, this student may have a mentor from the family, a grandfather or dad itself. And on the other hand, he may be connected having a mentor who is expert in some field or somebody who is at the same age and shares the same passion but may not know about the subject or peers or somebody face to face locally from there. And as you see on this on this wall, there are connections that we have made. And each connection represents the work these two people are doing together. And there are QR codes. If you know about the QR codes, be you. Uh, a little bit, but feel free yeah, to uh, please something, yeah. break it down. It, 
So when you, so if you see, if Monica can zoom in, you, the Adam is having a QR code next to him, and that is, that represents a URL. When you scan with your smartphone that QR code, it links to the website that Adam has already linked to that QR code. Which means, if Adam is connected to Monica, if you see the link here, that means it, the link will show what they're working on. For example, it will show there is a small sticker on here that shows detox. So we're working on something called detox food. Adam is a CSU uh, student working on the research on that videos. So interdependency is important. So the, the kid will feel comfortable with the peers from different backgrounds. And the fourth chapter is mentor alongside, uh, which I think Monica can explain better than I can on that one, because I get confused between the interdependency and the mentor alongside. How about Amy? Amy, you could explain, right? Good. I get to explain where, yeah. you, where you want me. <laughs> <laughs> Where do mentor, I start? Mentor alongside. Show her the show her the picture of that thing, the BU thing. <laughs> Unmute me. Yeah. I wasn't noticing today when I was in there. Okay, all right. I, I can I can go ahead and just correct me, uh, Monica, if, if I'm wrong on that. So okay. the fourth chapter. Let's go back to the fourth one. Um, <laughs> The mentor alongside is something in which uh, whatever you do, you have you have a mentor uh, who is listening to you and and sharing with you on the subject. And 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 uh, as as I was talking to Monica, this actually also represents more of something than you give back to the community. I think you also become later on mentors to other people as you have gone through that phase. Am I right, Monica? <laughs> No, Monica's camera that. person there. She's doing a great job. I let me ask a question. I would love to see what that looks like um, with two people being mentored alongside. Something we used to do all the time and still do on teachers teaching teachers is ask. You know, what does it really look like? Can you give us an example? So could you could you tell a real story about somebody who was learning something and how mentoring happened? Hey, can you so, unmute me? Can oh, you unmute me? I can hear you. No, we didn't okay. mute you. No. Could we finish the room because the group's down here and then Absolutely. I'll go upstairs and talk? Okay, yeah. just this last one. You're not muted, the by the way. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. So, go, Judd Beer. Uh, so the last one is have, um, creating a culture of trust, which I think means uh, just assuming that people are good. So it is it also means listening to people, students, without a preconceived agenda, having no agenda. for, And, and that will also give room for these kids to express themselves and, and uh, moving away, away from more of a monetary system to more of a social system where we can learn from each other and build a trust between each other. And the most important part, that web. It's the wall that as you walk into the door, that's the wall is there. And the wall has three types of connections. If at the front of the wall, if you see, it is actually local connections connected with the green thread. And on the top, on the ceiling, there are people who are either connected virtually, only virtually, like you and me. If we have a connection that will represent a virtual connection, it will be me on that wall and you on the ceiling. Maybe both of us are on the ceiling. So, and the third part is having somebody who is connected virtually and locally. Now, Monica and I are connected locally as well as virtually. So this wall, the wall that you just saw, represents connections. And each thread, each connection represents what two people are on. And as we go along, we, we are going to put QR codes instead of the wall. So every time you just scan your the QR code, it will automatically take you to the link of the updated work and what they're working on. The Thanks, Jodhbir. Thanks. Um, it's funny that Amy couldn't talk about Mentor Alongside since she's written most of the chapter, and I learned it all from her. I mean, how to actually do it. Um, the story that you were asking about, hmm. um, Amy is the best example. She came into the lab last year with her two kids, and um, 
So Lucy's interested in drawing and she's interested in dogs. Lucy connected with another girl in the lab that is a dog trainer. And this other girl in the lab would help Lucy with that. Well, when Amy was in there, Amy also has some artistic, uh, you know, ability and I think passion towards it. But what she would do is she wouldn't say, no, Lucy, do it like this, or why don't you try this? Um, Amy's trying to teach me how to not use the word should. And so she would just come in with her own drawing pad and she would sit beside Lucy and she would just be there. And I asked her one day, you know, do you, do you, like she was drawing dogs. And I was like, are you really into dogs? And she said, I just thought I'd draw dogs because I knew Lucy liked it, you know. But Amy loves drawing. And so she's sitting next to her, completely available to her kids. And I think you heard last week or the week before Everett talking, somebody asked Everett, how did you learn to do HTML code? Mm -hmm. And nobody set him up. I mean, we were blown away. And he's just like, well, I just found this HTML code book on the table, you know. So the mentoring alongside is, is not teaching. It's deliberately not teaching, you know, and it's, it's realizing that um, I'm going to learn just as much from them as they are from me, and it's just being available as a resource. But it, the only way for it to happen is that last chapter, you've ha got to have this relationship, this culture of trust, because just from the last three years where the district's given me this opportunity to really listen to kids, it's taken some of them two to three years to believe that I really wanted to hear what they had to say. And that's Amy's listen without an agenda. So now, Amy, you would have said that so much better than me. What happened to oh, you? Oh, you said it beautifully. <laughs> I guess I, I think that the listening part has become so important to me that I actually have trouble like wanting to speak up because I love to hear what other people are going to say or what their take on it is because I mean I know what my take is. Okay. But so Amy, anyway. we eliminated 30 guests tonight so we really want to hear from you more so. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, well, I, I would say that um, this mentoring alongside is not a term that I had heard of before. But um, that, that's just kind of what naturally evolved in my family, um, you know, getting really to know who my kids are when I haven't overscheduled them, when I haven't decided what it is they need to be learning, when I've really put aside my own expectations for them and, and really opened my heart and my eyes to see who they really are. Not who I think they are, but who they are, what what they want to do, what they love. And then, um, you know, after they go to bed at night, I'm Googling whatever it is what, that they want to know to try to find more resources for them. So uh, that's how uh, computer programming books ended up on our coffee table. <laughs> and so I can see classroom teachers right now going, that can never happen. How could I possibly know all these kids? But that's how we're redefining No Child Left Behind, that facilitating the people that already have that incredible family relationship um, with, with even more exposure to things, but especially taking those kids that don't have that exposure at home and don't have that means at home, and now saying, okay, let's make sure that everyone in the public school system is connected to one other person. That's the interdependency. Um, so that that everybody is known by someone, and mm -hmm. through po st studies with poverty and everything else, we feel like the basic necessity is relationship, and and that being known by someone, and just what you can do when when that freedom is given to you, and that um, that resource that there's someone listening to you and will facilitate that. So that's the interdependency, and they do blend together. They'll mentor alongside in the interdependency. I was we just felt gonna like mention, there was enough of each one that we needed to distinguish that. I was just going to mention one that Deb, that's what Deborah Meyer at Central Park East emphasized too: is relationships and how how shocking it is that you can be in high school and not know anybody, um, right. not know any of your teachers. Well, and, and Amy touched on something really important when she said, um, "So then, it, when Everett goes to bed, she's googling stuff." Well, that's normal in their family. And we've got another incredible family in the lab that their house is like chitty chitty bang bang. I mean, how lucky are they? Um, but what about now, let's take the 80 year old or the older person in the community, you know, that 
doesn't have those relationships, and I, I say this over and over, but it's such a poignant um, picture of it. So here's the 80-year-old taking meds, you know, and no visitors, watching TV all day. Here's the teenager taking meds, um, getting in trouble or whatever, and now we match.com them together, and it's for passion, not for kindness. And so like Amy's talking, now this is really unusual that this 80-year-old now gets Wi-Fi because of the connections they've had with this, this teenager for passion and just all the ramifications that can have for health and for budget and for not needing more things, not needing the medicine um, because we've cut to the heart of the matter and we're green about people and we're talking about relationships and people agendas um, more than anything else. So, unless you have another question, Paul, I really want to make sure we get to um, I, the detox again. Now back to Chapter 1 and the detox, and how are we going to document that? And some exciting things happened this last week with Joe Beer and Everett and Jim Folkstead. But I can see you have a question, so go I do. ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so what I'm, what I'm wondering is, is what you guys have thought about time, because Mentoring alongside sounds like it takes a lot of time, and um, you know the idea of being overscheduled in a family. You look at a school, we're way overscheduled. So, have you thought about that and how that's been different? Absolutely, because when you take out the prescribed learning, you take out mm -hmm. seventy percent of the class time and the money and the people that we're spending right now in classroom management. So it's like, mm -hmm. we're going to be going, dang, where did all this time come from? You know, kid, we now have three full-time kids in the lab. So your question to Joe Beer about how many times does a kid come over? Well, that mm -hmm. just happened in the last week, and it was the kids hammering at me. I was like, no, we've decided it's like Google 20%. You just come for one of them. Well, I, you know, sometimes when you, when you are so adamant about things, it's because it's the thing that you're having the most, you know, you're doing the worst in your own life. The last two years, I tried to resign from the district, saying, this is too big. I cannot do math anymore. I've got to focus on this. And so finally this year, they, you know, I'm, I'm not doing math. Um, I'm 50% learning innovation TOSA. Well, the kids this last week were saying the same thing to me, kids who have been in the lab a couple years. We can't do all this other stuff. If, you know, we've, we, we come here, and we're so exhausted from everything else. So finally, they got through to me, and I'm like, you're saying exactly what I said. Why, why am I not listening to you? So we've got three kids that are full time, and I think that they're now they have a space where they are gonna get to blow us away. And 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 once you have that freedom, I don't think they're gonna be loafers. You know, that's our biggest fear. Okay, what if what if they become loafers? Um, but I, I who, who's to say that we aren't loafers now? We just look very busy. We look very busy. So but to me, that's a much bigger risk. And so your question about how are you going to deal with time? We have no idea the time that we, not in a bad sense, no one's doing this, you know, in, with bad intentions, but we waste a lot of time, you know, with meetings or going to professional development to see how to motivate the kids when it's in them, you know. So we, the four-year plan, we think by year four we'll have this culture of trust turned around and we will be using our resources better. And we'll be blown. We'll be blown away by how much time we really do have. We really want to make it so that the day ends maybe at three. More time with the families. So those three full-time kids come early in the morning, leave in the afternoon, or go in and out when they need to. Is that right? They pretty much live here. I mean, they okay. really, you know, when they're. It is funny because it's like mm. now that they've gotten this more free time. They're staying until 9 and 10 at night. You know, their families are coming over. Um, it, it's, it's so addictive. It's, and it's a detox. Is, people keep pushing us back on the word detox because it's like you're, you're really trying to change it, and it's a quiet revolution, and then you throw out the word detox, you know. But we want to emphasize that we are addicted to a dependency on prescribed learning, and it's not voting us well. I mean, if we are seriously looking at the people around us, it is not a healthy situation. And, and so um, if we look at now kids are allured into something that's very healthy because it's a people and a relationship sort of a thing. And I do want to emphasize one more time before we have to go to Joe Beer and Everett um, that this is a temporary thing. 
that, that we think will get back to this natural um, process of learning. But in, in no way does it take away the people who are, you know, geeking out about gaming, geeking out about chemistry, geeking about, out about mathematics. I would be one that would be saying, the Joe guy on the wall, I'd be saying, I want five, I want number theory, I want, you know, I'd be geeking out on all the math. And so we're not getting rid of everything. We're just saying who's together in a room doing that is per choice. And so now, I mean, who, who's to say we wouldn't have the cure of cancer because now we have more of a focused group instead of, you know, dealing with the people that really don't want to be there. Same with the teachers. The teachers are now freed up, no prescribed learning. They can do what, what they went to school to do, you know. No one told us that we went to school to be a math teacher and it was going to be 70% of the time spent on classroom management, you know, so it's really for everybody. Okay. Great. Where's Everett? Bring Everett on. I'll, I'll go get Everett. <laughs> okay. Judd Bear, why don't you set us up with the conversation maybe that you had with Jim and Adam this week and what you guys are, are setting out to do with the detox um, documentation. So here's the thing. This is the most important thing about the BU house. The conversations happen and they, out of nowhere, they lead to something more meaningful. Adam and I were talking about my job, how I work in the radio frequency communication, telecommunication. And he just proposed his problem of managing all these videos, taking each student's video and storing an individual folder and this thing. And being an engineer, I know most of these things can be done automatically. Hey, everyone. Hi. Hi, Everett. Thank you for coming. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, Lucy. Hi, Lucy. <laughs> so, so what happened is that out of that conversation, we came up to the point that we need these videos to be automatic, maybe with the face detection when you walk in. If your profile is already there, it will record the video and automatically store in some place. But the next question was for the research, they need to find out what you are talking about for example you are at the end of one year you have 300 videos and initially you will start with keywords like the, we have four keywords uh, notice dream connect and do and then out of if initially you will start with connect uh, sorry um, notice you will talk about noticing things and later on you will use the other words and go up to the do thing i did that i connected with that person so for the research, it's important to find out from the day one to the day 360, at the end of 365 day, what actually happened and the process itself. Rather than current system, we have just testing that measures every one month or six months. Now, coming back to the point, what we are doing at this moment, to create a software so that we can tag the videos based on what they say on these four keywords and also on some other keywords. Uh, yesterday, Amy and I, and even Everett know about this thing, we we are trying to make it simple for everybody because it's a very complex software. Even Everett hasn't done anything on that one. Wait, wait, and wait, wait, are, wait. Not as have... Yeah, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. So, so the thing that, that we are doing briefly is that we are going to measure the learning of a child with through their reflections in their videos without letting them know that we are measuring something. Now these videos or the output of this thing, for example, of this whole thing will be, you will get the measurement of their development or their learning through their own words rather than from somebody else. Am I right? Yeah, that sounds great. Sort of, but I don't. I think it's pretty transparent, isn't it? It's not like that we're hiding that we're right. measuring something. I think. I think what he means is it's not right. like sit down and do multiple choice. It's it's more like a conversation, and right. But we're, yeah, and the kids they know they don't, they don't have anything like they have to record one video every day. They don't have to do this thing. Whenever they have content to talk about, they will go talk about it and go out. That's the whole point. There is no pressure, no one. And we don't analyze these videos in front of them. We, uh, I'm sure initially, as we saw with the ladies who just did the detox, she went in for the first time and she didn't know what to do. She was quite uncomfortable. 
after one minute she started looking and then thought about what she did in the day and talked about that how she made some dumpling not dumpling something else uh, but and how she liked about it and how interesting it was and everything so they will be as as i as, as we can see from that video for people who are new to this there will be a small phase of uncomfortableness for them to not express themselves what to talk about and then i think after one week or after three or four videos they will know what to talk about we all talk to ourselves in our head and that's the video is you just go and talk to yourself and yeah that's the whole point every do you want to add something ever so Everett, did you do you want to share what you what you're in your head right now what you're seeing that you're trying to do with this whole um programming can you hear me Everett? yeah okay um, I, i'm not asking it very well but i'm just wondering what you're thinking is going on you know what 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 you've been working on so far what you've been talking about with um Jod beer programming's point of view anything that you think that that you have got the grasp of what we're talking about you may not have to talk about the research thing whatever you whatever you is in your head right now um <laughs> what did you say <laughs> <laughs> they, they just want to know what what's, what's the all right what's your programming problem that you are facing what 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 is it that you are trying to do well right now i still need to figure out how to do the voice recognition so remember, um, we were talking, and there is probably already voice recognition software out there, so that would generate a text file. Mm -hmm. So then, what could you do? So what do you mean? You mean that in what what code? Well, let, let me explain. Code? Every I, I can speak on on your behalf because it was my idea. I can't understand. Writing. what it's hard so ever there's delay too so yeah yeah here I, i'll turn up the volume we have some extra noise in here it's hard to hear <laughs> so um so right now because we we were working on to make the use the voice recognition software that will tag based on the you know whatever the word they say which is a very difficult thing however it is open source which will just, will just need it more time so we came up with the idea and we I briefly discussed with Amy and sorry, briefly discussed with Monica, which is as they speak, there's a video that is being generated alongside there will be a text file that will be generated, whatever they say. So there's a transcript of, of something that they say and there's a video and audio. So we have all this data that we can use to analyze, to do our research, what is happening from the day one to the 365th day. So what what we're looking at is we have like now over 800 videos, you know, that's a lot of data and it's three dimensional. And to a kid, a lot of it's just conversation and reflection. And so great to us, great resource to look into the mind of a kid or an adult, you know, and see over time, are they growing? Are they getting better at noticing things which we think is huge um, are they getting better at making connections to things um, we can also extrapolate you know someone's working on game design or someone's working on one girl one of the full-time girls um, she wants to be a natural what do you say Amy natural a naturopathic doctor <laughs> yeah. and so she getting better at that goal you know at, 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 at becoming that so we can ex now we have this huge, huge resource because of the automation of technology and the ability of a person to program. We can take out just the specific that we want at that point in time, um, as opposed to be depending on at 11 o'clock on Thursday, we're going to find out you know what you can put on this piece of paper. Now it's we've got anything. And if, if we want to find out something about a person, we just we just you know go into the programming and pull that piece out much more humane much based more on reflection which we think is missing um, we do all this testing we spend so much money on testing and we don't really use it for reflection we just use it to label people and it's also based on 
are you getting better as compared to yourself as instead of as compared to other people and i think we are not giving them feedback on what they are saying that means they don't have any pressure to say what we want them to say because no one is involved in the detox food it's only them and we are not giving them any feedback on what you said so they have they would be more honest in that rather than a test in which after two weeks we have to give them what you did on that one so that's going to be a very big factor we t we've gone back and forth on that piece alone quite a bit um, and this is all experimentation I mean we're just everything we do that's why every day is different it's experimentation and we might find out tomorrow we need to go a different route but we thought this detox booth is so fake you know we did Google Docs last year and the kids didn't blob onto it and we came up with the detox booth and we thought still it's so fake we should have another person sitting there so it's a conversation but when we met with Jim and Adam and Judd Beer at um, Colorado State University this week um, or whenever it was, um, we talked about that now takes away, you know, statistically it takes away some bias of, well, what depends on what person is there talking to you, what kind of answer you're going to give them. So we thought this would be research wise, uh, a much better basis for all the people floating through that booth, you know, that it's the same, there's no one there, it's just you, you know, which is part of the main part of our detox is B and being alone with yourself and what's going on in your head, you know. Did you think of anything, Everett? Did anything pop into your head? Uh, what do you, about what? Uh, about like what's in the code or what? Yeah, yeah, tell us some about like what, what have you struggled with so far and learned from your struggles when you were trying to help with this coding? I kind of struggled with why the code wasn't compiling the code the code for the face recognition and I, and basically I learned that I didn't want to do it in, in C++. <laughs> right. This is this has been huge for Everett because we can't keep up with him. <laughs> you know, and to have Joe Beer there who could, you know, keep up with him in a conversation and now for them to be connected. You know, mm -hmm. having that face to face now, I, I believe Everett and Joe Beer are going to be talking quite a bit. You know, so that that was that was huge, and that's part of the rhizomatic expertise. That you know, who's to say who's the expert here? And it's a give and take all the time. And for Everett, the pressure was you know because he knows so much about this. Sometimes the pressure is on him, and he feels like he has to know everything. And I think he's starting to learn that. We don't know everything. Why in the world would you think you have to, you know? Right. So it's been very, you know, a, a very good balance for all of us to have had this face to face. Question? <laughs> um, it see, it. I love the the amount of data you're collecting, and what I've what I've been listening for though is how the learner might use that data him or herself. It does seem to me that that assessment really is not about what researchers do or what we can prove to other people, but the heart of it is, you know, how the learner can use it to know where they are. So I'm just wondering if that's entered into your thinking. Absolutely. Does anybody else want to take that? <laughs> Joe Beer has well, his I think hand from up. my perspective, maybe you, Monica, will have a different perspective. And Emmy would have your question that how the learner can use that data to 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 see how they're improving. Yeah, that was his question. Yeah, I actually I said think, see where they are because maybe you're not always improving. <laughs> but yeah, I think oh, for that, for, for that yeah. they would be the first person. I mean, he or she would be the first person to know this thing that where they are because they are putting the words in that video because the, I'm saying it from my own experience as well we I mean we can judge ourselves better than anybody else in the world how we are doing on something and and the connections that the people make and the way they would be talking about the stuff that they are doing or dreaming about that will be the biggest assessment for themselves to figure out how they're doing on that thing. 
and we often don't take time for that. I mean, this is like a 3D journal. And we are, I think we'd all agree, yep. especially you call how important it is journaling, you know, for reflection. Um, and so this is, this is giving them space to do this. And again, this is temporary. We think it's natural to reflect, but we've gotten so used to doing stuff and then letting everybody else decide how good we are, you know. And to us, in the process of learning reflection is such a huge piece. Um, so we'd see three things that's beneficial to this detox documentation. Number one and, and foremost is now a learner is face front with reflection and they're using it to improve themselves. Some ways we can do it, they can extrapolate themselves because they'll be making their own videos to show what they're learning. I mean, at the end, they're going to be talking about in front okay. of a panel, what did I learn? You know, So they might pull together a video of, well, my favorite thing that I did this year was this, and so they'll pull out all the stuff for that, and they can show in two minutes going from day one to day 365, and they can see themselves, you know, wow, in the beginning I had nothing to say, and in the end I, they, I wouldn't stop, and where did I learn all those big words, and how did I make that happen? In the beginning I would have guessed that never would have happened. Or any, any topic they can pull out. The second thing is that now we also have this huge resource if somebody – it doesn't isn't a self-directed learner and wants to try this well now we have all these videos where they can pull out a kid noticing stuff and they can watch the videos that come together because of that um, so it's a way to share and let other people see models of this happening And the third way and again why we hope it's you know temporary is for us to say to Bill Gates or to say to Obama um, this you know all this money that we're spending on testing isn't this a more humane way? And look at look at what you can see from testing or assessing or whatever in this in this way. You know, when you say that we're doing stuff to prove things, that really compromises as well. So it's not like we have this goal in mind that this would be an assessment tool, um, but we do see it as a goal in in replacing the assessment tool that we have right now that everyone's so focused on. Amy. Yeah, I would agree with you all that um, I'm not sure how important having record of these videos would be for the person because they have an ongoing recollection of how they're doing. I mean, especially if they have space, you know, and they're not so busy that they can't even recall, like, what happened, you know, this morning, what did I eat for breakfast this morning? They, they have time really to become more self-aware than I think that the necessity for, you know, them to retain this as a, an assessment tool is really not important. So making the video... As an unschooler, that, that sounds ridiculous to me, like that, right, exactly. that they would need that. <laughs> I think one analogy I can make here is like, if I, today I start writing my blog and by one year would I improve on that or not that will that can be measured from the quality of what I write or something so I think I'll definitely improve on that one if I'm consistent with that thing and because this detox is uh, that's our name for a process of learning and that's the focus of what we want to do to get to be a self-directed learner just the fact that they go in and talk about it they're getting better at you know, so now in the future they change their passion or they change what they're doing and they don't know what to do. Well, they they have this second nature of when I don't know what to do, what do I do? Well, first of all, I, I chill for a bit and find out what am I, who am I, am I really doing something that I really want to do or am I doing something that somebody else is, you know, imposed on me? And then next step, I do I notice, what do I notice? So they've got this second nature. That's... To, that's what I think will be most beneficial to the learner is they've practiced over and over this process that we often neglect, you know, because we're just given directions. So we don't really have to learn. We can just answer people's questions, you know. So for the learner, yeah, I, I, would, I, go, I just want I, just for the learner, it may not matter so much if there's any recording done. It's the process of the talking that's most important. It, it depends on the learner. I mean, it depends. Like Amy, they're, this is, it's hard for them to get into this because they do it all the time. It's second nature right. to them already, you know. Right. Um, 
But for I some would, the other extreme, then it, all of it Monica, might be. Fun. I was going to say that, like, my kids never say they're bored, and I don't give them things to do. They always have a cue of things in their head that they wish to accomplish, and um, that is because they, you know, they've been working on themselves. I'm not giving them directives all the time. So I think, you know, the first thing is to become comfortable in your boredom. <laughs> aren't, and, and I mean, aren't they bored when you go, when you go to the shopping? Uh, you know, it's funny. I had to go, I was at the lab today and they were like, oh, can I help you? Oh, really? wow. <laughs> what are we going to buy? It was very strange. <laughs> and I'll, the Sierra who started full time in the lab, um, she is extremely ambitious and has made amazing connections already. But Day one, day one in the lab, I think. You know, partway through the, the day, she's like, I, I don't know what to do anymore. And I was, we were, <laughs> all, we were all like, perfect. You need to embrace this. I have an idea day. for her. <laughs> I know you do. But embrace this. You could day. moderate my nutrition group for a while. <laughs> they, kids don't have that space today, you know? And so how would we expect them to practice a process of learning if they've never given a space to think for themselves, really. You know, when you have this set outcome, you do become mindless. And so that's why a lot of kids in college, when they're asked, what's your passion or what do you want to do? They're like, huh? You know, no one's ever asked me that before. Um, so, And again, we talk in extremes. This doesn't mean everybody goes through that. And this doesn't mean a lot of things are going to go away. We don't think that at all. And I think that brings a calm about us that we're not asking anybody to change if they love what they're doing. You know, keep on geeking out on what you're doing. It's just, if you don't love what you're doing, maybe just even changing the room up for you. Who's together in a room, you know? that That's the point of the measurement and the collaboration with CSU is to find out how effective this is and is there like one way that it happens or many ways. Experimental. I'm waiting. But I, Well's done. I had a question. Okay. Um, in Adam's recent video, uh, his own detox, he talked about the superintendent visiting. Can you talk about what that was like a little bit? And that's the other thing I, I do want to emphasize is like um, we're, we keep asking Everett questions, but there's so many videos already, and we're working on a means so that you can pull them out easier. But there's videos of Everett answering all those questions, and there's vid videos of you know people talking about all this stuff. So and and this is an evidence of how good that is that we're transparent. So now you can see Adam's talking about the superintendent coming to visit, and I'm thinking it's from the first visit, the first time he came to the house which we only had, I mean, some of this is a surprise to him because it's a surprise to us. I mean, we're all <laughs> living in perpetual beta, right? right. So um, he comes for the first time to visit the house, and it's not exactly what he'd expected to see. Um, so conversations throughout that visit um, led us to say, well, it's not – we're not really being as visible as we thought we were. Some of this stuff is still in our head or it's still on the web. And that after he left that day was amazing. That's when we came up with, let's do the QR codes. Let's make it so it's user friendly house. Um, and let's get out as much as it's in our heads about this whole um, plan um, onto the walls. And so now on the walls, what we're planning, we prototyped even more. And, and so we've got, our dream is to have 11 by 14s of Everett, 11 by 14 black and white of Everett next to 11 by 14 black and white of, of Jode Beer. Under, and we have this prototype, but they're just really little pictures. Underneath is um, a description of what they're working on together. But there's also a QR code of showing them in action of working on it together. So he's, he's been back. Superintendent Ron, who's an amazing person, has been back. Um, that resonated better with him that he saw that, oh, now this, the walls are telling the stories that I was hoping to see. Because when you come, you never know. It could be an empty house. It could be that 30 kids are there. Um, so we wanted it hey, to be today, This afternoon, um, one of the ladies who cooks 
brought brought her friend a blind woman in and she wants to come and you know read stories to the kids and she and everett were talking about a pack uh, I have no clue what it was called. Right, so anyway, it's this, like, essentially it's a Braille computer screen that she'd really like to get, and oh, wow. it was just really fun getting to talk to her, and the whole way home my kids were asking questions, you know, like, has she always been blind? Can she see anything? And I said, well, these are good questions to ask her next time we see her. There, I mean, there's constant, like, the experiences are changing, and it's not the same way two times when you go in there even morning and afternoon it was different today <laughs> i stepped so, out for 10 minutes to get lunch and it was different <laughs> and so strewing the story with on the wall with the qr code you know like now there's an, a piece of artwork and a kid will take you know do the qr code or there's words there too we don't want everything to be computerized we don't want everything to be by hand but he can see, oh gosh, this is an artist, even from here, I want to meet him. So as an unschool mom would do, we're trying to strew as much exposure for all kids, you know. And again, to emphasize, success for us will be that there is no lab, a physical space lab. It is now in the people, and it's in all the high school buildings that are now resource centers, very similar to what we're trying to do in the lab. Um, we've got a recording studio there, um, and different things that kids would design um, but anyway so the, the second visit was m much and and just to say Ron our superintendent has been extremely supportive of this all the way through I mean his desire is that we listen to kids and that we help kids as best we can and we're probably as much ex different as as can be as far as how that can happen so he's been extremely supportive and after this second visit we came, you know, we like we always have, saying that, you know, this isn't going to happen just today. It's going to take a while for us to have these conversations. But if we can keep on believing that we both want the same thing or that both of our worlds want to be the same thing, um, we can get there. So I don't know if that answered, but yeah, Adam's, Adam's insights have been good because he's going through the process of, you know, mm -hmm. doing his student teaching in a in a traditional setting, a more traditional setting, and being in the lab. So it's it's pretty fun to watch him go through those gyrations as well. <laughs> Poor guy sometimes. <laughs> schizo. Schizo is a good word for it, maybe bipolar. I do have We've all one kind of crazy question that's been eaten at me. Um, and your interest in nutrition and cooking, I'm wondering, do you have a garden space near the house? We're in the process of getting a greenhouse built because one of the kids mm. in the lab last year was heavy into permaculture. And so, yeah. And again, it's that time. These three kids are brilliant because they're they're pumping things out now. Um, but yeah, like Hans, he's got a full load now. He's a senior this year. But the plan is to, to build a greenhouse so that we do have mm. that there. Cool. I guess we're up on time, but uh, do you want to go around and have sort of last thoughts or? Whatever you're thinking. What did we miss? <laughs> I'm sure we missed a lot. But Ever, what's your last thought here? What are you thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember what I was thinking about. <laughs> Ever, we're learning not, <laughs> not to put a would be young person on the Ever, spot did, like this. <laughs> like the Ever, Ever, tell us. Um, I had a great conversation with Everett today because I, mean, I love math, you know, and he's doing scratch and I think he's got some suggestions for the scratch team um, at MIT. Um, but anyway, he was sharing me, can you tell a little bit about your circles and using the sine waves and the cosine yeah. wave? So I had made like a little program so you can click and drag and then it draws like an ellipse. And it uses like mm -hmm. sine and cosine to draw it. And so by his exploring, um, he was able to explain to me um, and the patterns and some of the key factors of sine, you know, a sine graph, a cosine graph, and a tangent graph. And, you know, some 10th and 11th graders still can't get because 
we've stuffed them so full of these facts that they have to regenerate to us that they're missing the essence of zooming out and what is this really what what happens with that i mean what were you telling me about the you had to not use the sine wave for something because you had to use the cosine wave and he was able to just have this intelligent conversation with me about it. um so so at first the it drew a, a diagonal line instead of a circle and that was because for, it was also using sine for the y position i was supposed to use and i should have used cosine but i fixed it <laughs> So we got into conversation about asymptotes because of the tangent, what the tangent, you know, graph does. So anyway, thanks, Everett. You're welcome. Jopi, or Amy, perhaps... last word. Oh. Yeah, Amy, go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, I would just say that uh, going into a space with other people who share this idea of um, enjoying who you are and being passionate about learning has um, actually even advanced um, our desire to learn. It's like, oh, learning isn't just something that we like to do. It's something that other people think are, is cool too, you know? So it's, it's interesting to see what's coming out of my kids since we uh, started, you know, participating in this. Cool. Thanks okay. for joining us, Patricia. Joe Beer, what's next for you or what's now for you? It's my turn? Whatever. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> um, I saw this. Well, ones. it was an interesting experience the 10 days with Monica and Emmy and everybody over there. So um, I really enjoyed I think that's that's a space that we need where you learn without with your intentions of learning. When, like, when I know that I have to learn something, the whole fun is out. So uh, every day is just an awesome day. Conversations happen, and that's the most important thing, that we need to listen to kids rather than talk to them. We just need to listen to them. That's it. Okay. Thanks. And I have nothing else to Paul. say. But... Paul, any last words? No? Nah. You know, uh, I did have one last thought. And that is that it's interesting how even in a traditional classroom, I think people could look at what you're doing and say, let me try this little part of it. Um, so that's it's great you have the sort of whole picture, but it's interesting that people could take little bits and pieces into their classrooms as well. So that's right. one we thought think even just noticing, you could just, mm -hmm. you could just at the end of every whatever say, by the time you come back here, I want you to notice something unlikely, and, it, and that will change a lot because we're just not used to that. I, I, would, I do want to just say that, again, the basis of all this is that learning is natural, and if, if we get back to that by not following a prescribed learning anymore, um, that, that'll take care of everything. It's not just that, oh, this is for artsy people or... Um, it's going to amp up all that we do. Um, if we get away from a prescribed learning that makes us dependent on more prescribed learning and makes us dependent on specific people to tell us what to do. So thanks thanks so much for the whole time, Paul. You're, well, you're swell. You. Um, and there will be a link to the book. And it's great that you're sort of creating it in public this way so people can go and check it out and give you feedback or thoughts definitely definitely sure. yeah we we appreciate any comments and, and you know this doesn't make any sense we want it to be useful so thank you um we should say that uh just to do our sort of uh end piece here that uh we've been broadcasting at edtechtalk.com and um this will go up at teacherstechingteachers.org and on Lab Connections. Um, and we want to thank Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo um, as who have set up that network. And thank you all. We'll see you again next week, next Wednesday. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Bob. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night.